So uh, I, I'm going to discuss three problems about incompressible fluids with, uh, in which there are boundaries. Uh, uh, these, and there they are on the, uh, on the slide. Water rates, the Muscat equation, and alpha patches. And uh, it, it's clear that in all these examples, singularities form. That's a remarkable phenomenon because although the fluid mechanics uh, world is full of uh, singularities, uh, every time uh, an airplane passes overhead and you hear a sonic boom, that's, that's a singularity. Um, uh, nevertheless, incompressible fluids are, are in some ways very hard to understand and there were no known examples, at least to the best, not known to me, there were no known examples of, uh, of, of physically interesting systems involving incompressible fluids in which one could prove rigorously that a singularity formed. Uh, in, in one particular case of this is the clay problem, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, damn it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, 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 but, but here, um, it, it happens that uh, a few years ago, uh, my, my, uh, uh, my friends and I at uh, ICMAT in Spain were able to prove um, rigorously the existence of um, singularities, of the, the formation of singularities in, in two distinct problems about incompressible fluids. So I'm going to talk about those two uh, and the third one in which, in which we have what we think are convincing um, uh, numerical studies, but, but no rigorous theorem. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the plan. So singularities form in uh, situations in which there are incompressible fluids, but also boundaries. By the way, uh, uh, so there, there is, uh, of course, a, a conference running, uh, among other conferences here, on, uh, on fluid mechanics and precisely on, on uh, systems with boundaries. And, and I warn the assembled experts that they're not going to learn anything from my talk. This is for a general audience. They've, the experts have heard it all before. Uh, OK. Uh -huh. uh, button. OK. So let, let me start by giving credit. So here are the teams. The, uh, the water waves team is, uh, is on the board there. Uh, and at least, well, I think several members of the team are in the audience. Uh, here's the Muscat equation team. I'll tell you what the Muscat equation is in a little while. <coughs> and here's the alpha patches team. Okay. And here are here are the papers. Okay. Uh, well, this is this is a talk for a general audience, so I'm not going to give the uh, precise, technically correct statements of the theorems, let alone the proofs. Uh, I'm going to explain intuitive ideas, the, the detailed, not only the precise statements, but the uh, um, detailed proofs can be found in the papers. Uh, but I, I do want to not just state results, I'd like to sketch ideas in the proof, and I'm going to do that for one of the problems, namely the Muscat problem. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, let's talk about water waves in two dimensions. Okay, so there's the picture uh, on top of the, well, notice, notice that there's a curved line on the, on the slide. That's, that's the surface of the water. Well, we're in two dimensions, so the surface of the water is a, a curve. Uh, above the surface of the water, above the interface, is a vacuum or air or something. Below that is water. And so at time t, the water region is called omega of t. Now, uh, um, the water is, uh, is moving around. Its velocity is u of x t. So u of x t is a, a vector in R2. Uh, and there is a pressure, p of x t, that's a scalar. Uh, x is, of course, a point in omega of t, the water region. t is a time. Uh, let's say gravity is also acting. So that's, uh, that's what we've got. Uh, a significant feature of the problem is that the functions we're solving for, u of x t and the pressure, p of x t, are only defined in the water region, omega of t, and we don't know what the water region is. It's moving with time, and part of the problem is to find the region. Okay, so it's a free boundary problem. Okay, uh, let's, let's represent the interface as a, a parametrized curve. So the boundary between the air and the water 
is given by z of alpha t. Think of t as a fixed time and alpha as a parameter. Uh, and so uh, for fixed t, uh, alpha goes to z of alpha t is a parameterization of the curve. That allows us to represent the, the interface as a function. But of course, the parameterization has no physical meaning. We can pick one parameterization or another. And in particular, the parameterization can be changed without necessarily changing the interface or, or changing anything of physical significance. OK, uh, uh, here are the equations. So uh, in omega of t, first of all, the fluid satisfies the 2D incompressible irritational Euler equations. And I've written them down. So uh, the, first, uh, the first equation just says that f equals ma. Uh, well, if, again, if you're an expert, you can simply uh, fall asleep or, or uh, check your email. But if, let's say, um, if you uh, work in some subject very far from analysis, uh, let me just explain what's going on. Uh, so let's look at, all right, now let me be careful not to touch the wrong button. Uh, that self it. What is that? Where is it pointing out? It's the top one. Top one. What do you see? Is ah. There, oh, there, okay, there it is. Uh, there it is, okay. So uh, here's u, the velocity. Here's, here's dtu, okay? So you would think that that's the acceleration. But no, no, that's, uh, remember, u of xt is the, u of xt is the velocity at a particular point x at a particular time t. Uh, if you want to think about the acceleration of a molecule, uh, you shouldn't stay at a fixed point and look at the time derivative of the, velo uh, of the velocity of, of the molecule that happens to be at a <coughs> given point. Instead, you should take one particular molecule, painted red, and follow it as it moves. And, and calculate the time derivative of the velocity of that molecule. And the position of that molecule is changing with time. And therefore, the left-hand side of the F equals MA equation uh, really is the acceleration of a, uh, uh, of a molecule. Uh, OK. And then on the right, you see simply the forces acting. There's minus the gradient of a pressure, and there's a force of gravity. Now, uh, all right, that's the first equation. Uh, the two equations at the bottom of the slide, uh, divergence of u equals zero. All right, water is incompressible. So that's divergence of u equals zero. How about curl of u equals zero? If I mischievously put my finger in the water and turn it like that, I, I will introduce a non-zero curl. Uh, and that's a very serious problem. But the easiest version of the problem is the, is the version in which the water is not rotating. And therefore, I declare that its curl is zero. And that's consistent with the equations in the sense that if it's true initially, and if there are no uh, fancy boundary conditions to introduce trouble, then, uh, then the curl remains zero. And so we, we study that case, and that's called the water wave equation. OK. OK. Um, now, let's see. We need further equations uh, so that we can get something like a unique solution. There's more physics in the problem. So what's going on at the interface? Well, first of all, the pressure is zero. Or let's say the pre all right, fine. The pressure is zero at the interface. Furthermore, the interface moves with the fluid. After all, we, we have, um, uh, we have a, a region that varies with time. And at the boundary points of this region, we have a velocity. And it, one had, for this thing to make any sense at all, uh, the, the, um, the region, the, the boundary had better move as if it were made of molecules, each of which is moving with the velocity indicated u of x t. And so uh, there's, there's the equation uh, sitting at the bottom of the slide. Notice that there's some arbitrary function c of alpha t. Uh, the the, the uh, z of alpha t can move with time in a way whose normal component is fixed, but whose tangential component is arbitrary, uh, because that affects only the parameterization, which has no physical meaning. OK? All right. All right, now in this uh, version of the problem, we've taken pressure and gravity into account. We've neglected surface tension. One can put in surface tension. It doesn't significantly change the problem, uh, either the physics or the mathematics at this level. OK, now we, uh, uh, so I've stated the equations. Now we take the interface uh, uh, and the velocity to be initially smooth. And the velocity initially is divergence free and curl free, because that's what our velocities are supposed to do. That's, that's the initial condition. 
we then solve for time going forward. We solve for, for non-negative time, and we ask whether a singularity can form in finite time. Charlie, the depth infinite? Pardon? The depth of the water is infinite? And the depth of the water is infinite. And one can, one can make a version of the problem, of course, with, with finite depth, and that's been studied since, but, but let me not get into it. Yes. Yes. OK. All right. OK, now a lot, of, uh, a lot of previous work has been done on, on water waves. Here are, the, here are the main results that I want to mention. In, in particular, uh, al although you might think it's, it's physically obvious that, that for a little while nothing much happens, that's a very deep problem which was solved by C.G. Wu in, uh, in 1997. Uh, uh, let's see, most of the work since uh, on, on this problem has been in the direction of proving that singularities do not form. Okay, and so uh, let, let me cut to the chase. The the bottom uh, the bottom two references to relatively recent work by uh, uh, UNESCO and Pusateri and uh, slightly later Alizao Delon uh, uh, show that in two dimensions for small smooth initial data, whatever small means for for some suitable definition of the word small. The solution continues for all time, and no uh, singularities develop, and that's that's a great achievement. Okay, uh, uh, there is also work on three D. Real water waves live in three D, and and here are the um, here are the people who have uh, discussed that, and I'll say a little bit more about three D later. All right, but again, the the focus has been on showing that singularities don't form. Okay, but in fact they do, and, and again, uh, I think you'll see that it's physically very, very natural, but one has to try to prove something. So here's what happens. Uh, here's, here's how the singularity looks. So, so at, in the first slide here, A, uh, the water is colored gray, and it doesn't look terribly singular or terribly exciting. There it is. It's a sort of harmless water wave. Okay, that's what's happening initially at time zero. So in particular, the velocity field u at the interface uh, uh, boundary of omega uh, are, are smooth. But at a later time b, something interesting has happened. The water wave has turned over so that the interface is no longer the graph of a function. Okay, But nevertheless, a singularity has not yet formed. Nevertheless, Look, if this fellow is heading rapidly that way, look, if this fellow is heading rapidly that way, uh, they are headed for a disaster. And what can stop them? Obviously, nothing. And so, uh, and so at uh, time, <laughs> yes, at, at some critical moment, uh, T2, um, uh, the interface self intersects at one point, uh, the, the heavy dot on the uh, on the picture, and we call that a splash. Okay, and so the interface turns, the water wave turns over and forms a splash. And the theorem is that that can happen. Uh, here's a variant of the splash, we call it the splat. So at, at a later time, the, the interface self intersects, but not merely at a point, but along an arc. The interface is uh, smooth otherwise, but nevertheless self intersects. Now, uh, do you want to call this a singularity or not? Well, that's, I would say, an accounting question. But uh, one thing is clear, there is no solution of the water wave equations that is at all physically meaningful beyond the time when, when these things happen. And therefore, I think my, my personal solution to the accounting problem is to declare that this is a singularity. OK, now those are pictures. What can we actually prove? Well, our, our team has, has two uh, theorems on this scenario. First of all, uh, we can prove rigorously that a water wave can start as in A, looking quite harmless, and then turn over so that it looks as in B. We can also prove that a water wave can start as in B, and then form a splash as in C, or a splat as in C prime. Okay, we can prove those things rigorously. What we would like to do is to show that a water wave can start as in A and then turn over as in B and keep going and form a splash or a splat uh, as in C or C prime. We have something in between nothing and a rigorous proof. We have 
uh, a very reliable looking numerical simulation. Uh, numerical simulations in general are, are very useful. They can tell you what's going on, but especially as you approach a singularity, uh, they, they uh, fail to be reliable. And the, the normal and terribly frustrating thing in fluid dynamics is that precisely as something really interesting starts to happen, uh, this, the uh, simulation uh, loses reliability. And, and the, uh, this particular simulation, for reasons that I am not going to explain in this talk, remains obviously reliable right up to the moment of the formation of singularity. Uh, there are easy tests you could perform that will convince you with a little common sense that your simulation is either uh, reliable or not. And this, this uh, passes with flying colors, but it is a simulation. And so we are working to produce a proof. And the way we uh, have in mind to produce the proof is that we will, uh, we will prove that near, what our com near the, the approximate solution produced by the computer, near that is an actual solution that behaves the way the simulation behaves. And so if it works, if and when it works, it will be a rigorous computer-assisted proof. And you, you've probably heard lots of examples of computer-assisted proofs. I, I don't have time to explain. Speaking of time, how are we doing? OK. All right. Uh, let me just come back to uh, three dimensions and mention uh, an important paper of Coton and Scholar, which show uh, that this phenomenon is not uh, related, I'm sorry, it's not restricted to two dimensions, that there is a three-dimensional splash. Now, one can take our two-dimensional splash and simply trivially take the Cartesian product with, a, with one extra dimension in which nothing happens. And then you will have two waves that intersect along the line. But, uh, but this paper shows that, in fact, two, uh, uh, two waves can intersect at a point. And, and that's a genuinely three-dimensional thing. OK, uh, let me mention uh, uh, a few further results also. Um, I, I think I'll invert the order. Um, uh, on the bottom of the slide, it says that adding viscosity, uh, that is Navier-Stokes instead of Euler, uh, change, uh, change the equation inside the fluid uh, so that uh, we're, we, we add a viscosity term. We're solving Navier-Stokes instead of Euler and therefore also change the boundary conditions to Stokes boundary conditions. OK, this does not stop the splash. That's physically clear. Mathematically, it's something of a mess. But uh, well, all right, well, well uh, th thank you again for the uh, flattering introduction. If one, if one is willing to uh, um, face uh, technical difficulties, uh, which are not so simple. But if you're willing to face it, this, this works. Uh, and it, it's clear that it should. Uh, Maybe I'm not being quite, quite fair. There's, there are, it's not just slogging through the text. There are ideas. OK, anyway. Uh, but, uh, but now let me ask, what can stop the splash? And the answer is an opposing fluid. So remember, we've been talking about a water wave on one side of an interface and a vacuum or, or air, which is treated as a vacuum, uh, on the other side of the equation. Now, uh, I'm sorry, on the other side of the interface. Imagine instead of that, there are two fluids. Let's say they're both incompressible. Uh, one of them is water, and the other one is very, very, very light. It has very low non-zero density. What happens? Well, in the beginning, the, uh, there is um, uh, the, the, the low density opposing fluid does almost nothing. It just gets out of the way. But as the splash is about to happen, it is subject to very extreme stress. And, and uh, in, in desperation, it fights back. Now, what does it do? Uh, well, uh, one thing that it does is that it makes sure that a splash, in the sense of, uh, that I explained before, does not happen. So that's joint work with Alex Ionescu and uh, Victor Lee. Um, uh, but one has to be careful. What do you mean by a splash? The careful mathematical definition of the splash, which I am not going to give in this talk, uh, includes the statement that the interface remains smooth. And the only thing that, uh, that goes wrong is that it self-intersects. So uh, uh, for, for, for a while, uh, uh, Alex and I had a disagreement as to, um, as to what might happen, uh, what does happen, uh, as you approach an almost splash. Uh, the, uh, Alex's idea is that, in fact, uh, the, um, the, the, there is a tip that forms. 
And my idea is that there is a pocket that forms. And in, in Alex's version, uh, perhaps a singularity can still form, the surface can, the interface can still self-intersect but and, and at a single point, but smoothness is lost at the same time. And on the other hand, uh, uh, my idea was that instead of that, the opposing uh, fluid fights back so hard that little pockets develop in, uh, in both the left and right oncoming waves, and eventually those pockets grow and the waves are pushed apart. And uh, I, I think Victor, who was sitting there, I think Victor was neutral in this disagreement. Uh, Alex has convinced me that his scenario can occur. I don't know whether I've convinced him that my scenario uh, can occur, but none of us have proved anything about it. It's speculation. Okay. Okay, on to the Muscat problem. Uh, so the Muscat problem describes oil and water in, uh, in, in sand. Uh, I, I know nothing about the mathematics of fracking, but I wonder if that has anything to do with the Muscat problem. Uh, so we have, uh, an, again, let's, let's treat a two-dimensional problem. We have an interface. It's shown there as a curved line. Above the curved line is, let's say, oil, and below the curved line, let's say, is water. Now, oil and water do not mix. Okay, and so, uh, well, what if they do? That's an interesting question, which uh, was discussed at the uh, conference earlier. Um, but uh, let's say, uh, for purposes of this problem, oil and water do not mix. Okay, uh, a remarkable phenomenon, uh, as far as I can tell, a coincidence, is that uh, oil and water in a Helle Shaw cell, which I've shown there, uh, are governed by the same equations. A Helle Shaw cell consists of two uh, parallel plates of glass with a tiny, tiny space between them, exaggerated so that it's clear that there is a space. Uh, and then that, that, um, um, uh, that intermediate space is filled by, let's say, oil and water. This Helle Shaw cell is standing vertically. Uh, most, in most experiments, as uh, uh, Peter Constantine once uh, uh, admonished me, the uh, um, the, the cell is horizontal, but it can be held vertically, and, and one gets under that condition the, the same equation. Uh, the same equation, that is, the, the Muscat equation that I'm about to describe. So it governs both the Helly Shaw cell and uh, fracking. Okay, a remarkable feature of this problem is that F equals MA does not hold if you simply think about the two fluids. That's because the two fluids are both um, interacting with the pores in the porous medium. Uh, so, of course, F equals MA holds altogether, but, uh, uh, but we don't want to think about each little pore, uh, and therefore we have to do something else. Uh, every time I give this talk, I fail to resist the temptation to give one of my favorite quotations from literature. It's from, it's from War and Peace in the translation that I read. Uh, so remember, toward the end of War and Peace is a wonderful description, a wonderful uh, essay on the philosophy of history. And it includes, in the translation that I read, the following lines. Uh, we must seek to understand uh, the laws of history, which govern the affairs of mankind as surely as the physical world is governed by force equals mass times velocity. <laughs> I, 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 have asked, I have asked various Russian friends whether this appears in Tolstoy, and I got uh, conflicting answers. Um, the most interesting answer was, uh, well, Tolstoy went to my university, so I bet it's in the original. Um, so I don't know whether that's true, but in fact, uh, F equals MA does not hold here, and instead, Tolstoy's law, F equals MV, holds. It's, it's not, Tolstoy doesn't get due credit, it's called Darcy's law. Okay? And, and so, in, uh, in, when, when porous media li uh, move in a fluid, uh, it is observed experimentally and called Darcy's Law that the velocity is proportional to the force which is exerted. So on the right-hand side of Darcy's Law, you see minus the gradient of the pressure and you see a gravity term. That's simply the force exerted. And on the left, you see the velocity and not the acceleration. Uh, I've left out a proportionality constant. Uh, I, actually, I've left out two different proportionality constants, the porosity and the uh, viscosity. Never mind. Uh, uh, but I've not left out the density, and so this term rho, 
is equal to a function which is equal to the density of oil in the oil region and equal to the density of water in the water region. And so part of the mathematical uh, difficulty of the problem is that you don't know what the function rho is. Okay, at the interface, uh, of course the boundary of the water region is the boundary of the oil region, okay, because that's the interface where they meet. And again, we represent it as a parametrized curve. And again, the parametrization has no physical meaning. Now the oil and the water need not move with the same velocity at the interface, but the difference between their velocities had better be tangential or else very strange things might happen. The water and oil might fly apart or the water and oil might interpenetrate or something strange. So uh, one of the boundary conditions at the interface is that the difference between the, the velocity of the water and the velocity of the oil is tangential and the pressures also have to equal. Uh, all right, um, and so there at, at the bottom uh, is just the statement that the interface moves with the fluid. Well, that means it's transported along by the fluid velocity. Wait a minute, which velocity? The water velocity or the oil velocity? Uh, it doesn't matter which because of the fact that the difference is tangential. So that's, that's the setup. Okay, so we're neglecting surface tension here, and I'm also going to restrict to the case in which the oil and the water have different densities but the same viscosity. It's, of course, not true of actual water and oil, but never mind. All right. Uh, we fix conditions at time zero, and we seek a solution for positive time. So sometimes for, for uh, reasons of, of trickery, uh, we'll be solving for time flowing backward, but, but the interest that we have in the problem is, is that time wants to flow forward. We give conditions at time zero. We wonder what happens for positive time. Okay, now it turns out that it makes a crucial difference whether the heavier fluid, the water, is on top or underneath. In the good case, shown, shown on the uh, left, uh, in the good case, uh, the water is underneath. The heavy fluid is underneath and the light fluid is on top. In the bad case, it's reversed. Now, uh, that's bad for time flowing forward, but it would be good for time flowing backward. But a really bad case is a case in which the interface looks, uh, as on the far right, uh, in which, depending on where you look locally, either the oil is above the water or the water is above the oil. And so if time flows forward, life is bad for one reason. And if time flows backward, life is bad for another region, another reason. Okay, the Muscat equation in the good case is a nonlinear version of the equation on the slide. Uh, the square root of the Laplacian is something uh, uh, very well known to uh, every analyst. If you're not an analyst, uh, pretend, I mean, forget about the square root. This is sort of a good version. I mean, this is a nonlinear version of something like the heat equation. And in the bad cases, uh, uh, the, the Muscat equation is a nonlinear version of either the heat equation uh, with time flowing in the wrong direction, or uh, the heat equation with a coefficient in front of the Laplacian that changes signs so that you don't win by making time flow forward and you don't win by making time flow backward. Okay, uh, let me mention some of the previous work on, uh, on Muscat. So uh, if the initial data are small and in the stable regime, so with the water underneath, Global smooth solutions exist, and, and here are the people who, who proved it. Now, how small is small? Well, uh, it does, small doesn't have to be as small as that. For example, if the initial interface has the form of a graph, uh, x2 equals f of x1, and if the, if the slope of the tangent to the graph is always less than 1 in absolute value, that's not as small as all that, uh, and, and if the oil is on top of the water, then in fact global solutions exist. So if we're going to get a solution in, in finite time, it, it can't be uh, too uh, moderate. Well, all right, we're going to produce a singularity for this problem. And again, we're going to prove rigorously that the singularity forms. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, here's the... Uh, uh, here's how things start. Looks perfectly uh, innocuous. We are in a good and a stable case with the heavy fluid, the water underneath, and the oil on top. Couldn't be better. 
However, in finite time, the solution turns over so that it looks, um, uh, it looks very unpromising for, uh, uh, for the purposes of solving the Muscat equation. However, at this stage, um, although the fluid has turned, although the interface has turned over, uh, a singularity does not yet form. The, the, it, the, uh, the solution is still smooth and continues for a while. Nevertheless, at some still later time, a singularity forms at one single point. There it is. It's written as the origin. And so the solution uh, has turned over and is smooth except at one point, and at that one point it is not smooth. In particular, the interfaces involved are real analytic uh, except at the moment of singularity formation. And at that moment, the interface is real analytic except at a single point. But in the neighborhood of that point, the interface can, is C3 but not C4. Um, notice, notice that, um, uh, let's see, um, notice that, that I said the interface is C3 but not C4. That's different from saying that the parametrized interface is C3 but not C4. One could imagine that the interface stays perfectly all right, but the, um, uh, but the parametrization goes to hell. That's not what's going on here. The interface goes to hell. Uh, and although we, part, Can you show the picture? Uh, let me try oh, to do it without causing disaster. There. OK, so, so there's that one dot where, I mean, it's hard to see the difference between us, you know, where we're seeing <laughs> four fails, but, but all right. OK? OK. OK, and so we have a rigorous proof that all that happens. Oh, um, how am I doing? Uh, I'm, I'm going to change the order. These are the results that can be proved um, rigorously uh, the last thing I was going to, so what, what I had planned to do was to tell you about alpha patches um, in, in which we have uh, um, in, in interesting um, uh, simulations, um, but no proof, we, uh, they. Um, but I think I'm going to uh, change the order and show you how to prove uh, the formation of the singularity for the Muscat. And if there is time, I will, I will come back and tell you about alpha patches. Um, okay, so let's here are alpha patches. Um, that's the singularity that forms in an alpha patch. Uh, look, look at look at the left. That's uh, that's some uh, region with an interface. Uh, uh, later on, it's the, the it's forming a sharper tip. Um, still see infinity, but but sharpening, and the space between the two tips is going to zero. And at the moment of uh, uh, breakdown. Uh, instead of a nice smooth curve, we appear to have four arcs. <coughs> Pardon me. There is that very strange self-similar cascade of stuff, which I hope to tell you. All right, here's the sketch of the proof of the, of the Muscat. All right. Uh, so here are the main steps. So first, we're simply going to write down a contour equation. We're going to get rid of, of the fluid, the two-dimensional aspect of the problem, and just make an equation for the evolution of the contour itself. Um, the next, that, that's well known and easy. <coughs> Pardon me. OK, um, next thing to do is to find a real analytic solution of the Muscat equation for which the interface turns over. Okay. Never mind any singularity. Just make it turn over. And not only will it not yet have a singularity, it will be real analytic. Okay. Then the next thing to do, and then a tricky part of the, uh, of the proof, is to pick the correct norm. And then we're going to perturb Z0, uh, the turnover solution, in the correct norm to obtain a Muscat solution that turns over and breaks down. As far as I know, this is this is an idea which is seldom or never used because we have a situation in which nothing goes wrong and we use perturbation theory to show that near it something goes wrong. Okay. 
All right, writing down the contour equations. Again, that was known for a long time. So the evolving contour ha uh, is, is uh, this z of alpha t, and it lives in the complex plane. Well, it uh, never mind the complex plane. It lives in the plane, so z of alpha t has two components, z1 of alpha t, z2 of alpha t. Now, for one choice of the parameterization, that's the equation. Okay. Uh, and the proof is elementary potential theory of integration by parts. Uh, the, significant, the significant feature of this, as we start thinking about it, the significant feature is that that awful mess on the right-hand side is morally uh, a first-order differential operator. If z has, let's say, eight derivatives in L2, and you apply that mess, you will discover that it has seven derivatives in L2. The fact that it is morally a first-order thing means that we can apply the cauchy kovalevsky theorem and produce analytic solutions for a short time, starting from analytic initial data. And so the way we produce our, our Z0, uh, our, our unperturbed solution, is that we start with a real analytic curve. And I'm going to take this real analytic curve at the moment that we hope it turns over. And so at the moment that it turns over, let's say at, at the origin, uh, there will be a vertical tangent because it's turning over. Now, starting from that, assuming the interface is real analytic, Cauchy-Kovalevsky or whatever variant of the Cauchy-Kovalevsky uh, one needs for things that are not exactly PDEs, um, will produce, uh, we'll produce a solution defined in some neighborhood of t equals zero. And so there, are, uh, on the slide I've written that t varies between minus t zero and plus t zero for some small t zero. And so we have, we have an analytic solution. But does it turn over? Well, uh, to investigate that, first, first let's take the initial data to be, uh, so z0 of alpha is initially an odd function of alpha. And that has the agreeable property that then, as time varies, uh, the, the solution continues to be an odd function of alpha. And therefore, the origin is always on the, on the curve. Well, if the origin stays on the curve, we can then investigate the angle that I've called theta in the picture, the angle between the tangent and the vertical um, as a function of time. So at, pardon me, at the initial time when the tangent is vertical, that quantity theta of t was zero because the tangent was vertical. And uh, my convention is that in, in the picture that you're looking at there, theta of t is negative, okay? So we look at theta of t, and we make an elementary calculation to determine uh, the time derivative of theta at t equals 0. Now, whatever it is, that's some mess involving the initial conditions. So we don't have to know what the solution of the equation looks like. We just have to know what the initial conditions look like. And then we plug into some appropriate mess and discover the time derivative of the angle theta. And we hope that it has the right sign. Uh, I've drawn here the turnover case uh, in which at negative time, all right, let me again do this dangerous thing. There, at, at negative time, okay, uh, the situation is like that, theta is zero, but at time zero, theta, remember theta is zero on the vertical tangent, and then at time t positive, theta is positive, and so notice uh, here we have a nice, uh, nice interface, it's a graph of a function, it's about to turn over. It has turned over. This is the good case. On the other hand, uh, there's the anti-turnover case. And notice that on the left, theta is positive. And so the, we're starting from an interface that has already turned over. Uh, and then at time 0, uh, the, the uh, tangent is vertical. And at, time, uh, uh, pos and at positive time, theta is negative, so that we, we no longer have a turnover. So the <coughs> Excuse me. Must be lots of fun to hear this amplified by the microphone. Uh, uh, and so that's the anti-turnover case. And if that happens, then a turnover does not form. Rather, if there, if there were a turnover, it would, it, it would be annihilated. So that's bad. So uh, whether we're in a good case or a bad case depends simply on the sign of, of this uh, d theta by dt. One calculates it and gets a mess. One scratches one's head and thinks whether that mess has a predetermined sign, and the answer turns out to be no. Uh, by making a good choice of the initial curve, you can produce whichever sign you want, and therefore you can produce, in particular, a turnover. Okay. 
So what have we achieved? And how much time do we have? Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, we, have, we have found an unperturbed solution. It satisfies the Muscat equation in a short time interval around t equals zero. Uh, we, uh, we have applied cauchy kovalevsky so we're, we're, in the, uh, we're in the analytic world. Um, and, and so as a function of alpha, um, this, this z0 is actually a real analytic. It has an analytic continuation to a tiny strip. And the solution turns over, and the turnover occurs at time zero. That's what we've achieved. Now our problem is to modify this solution so that, uh, so that a, um, a singularity will appear. Okay, and so here's the plan to do that. For each time t, there's going to be a special norm for that time. And so there's a family of norms parameterized by the time t. We're going to find a Muscat solution, z of alpha t, close to the unperturbed z0 of alpha t in those norms. And the way we're going to find it is to start at time t equals plus t0 and solve backwards in time. Uh, how are we going to solve backwards in time? Uh, well, wait and see. But, but that's the plan. And we're going to prescribe initial conditions. I, I always hate to call them initial conditions when we're solving backwards in time. But uh, initial conditions at, at the latest time here, plus t0. And we're going to pick our initial condition so that z uh, at time plus t0 is c3 but not c4 at alpha equals 0. We will then solve backwards by, in time by perturbation theory, keeping z close to z0. Okay? It, uh, the, if we can do that, then we will get a solution of a Muscat equation, which is close to z0, and it breaks down because we prescribed the initial conditions to make it break down, and it turns over because it's close to the unperturbed fellow which, uh, uh, which turns over. That's the plan. But we have to be able to solve backwards in time, and the ability to do that has to do with these special norms. So let me describe them. So to define the norms, we first introduce a family of domains in the complex plane. Remember, our, our solutions to Muscat so far have been analytic functions of the, per, of the uh, parameter alpha. Uh, that's what's going to enable us to solve backwards in time. And we're going to make an analytic continuation to a domain omega of t in the complex plane that, that is parameterized by the time t. Each omega of t will contain the real axis, so uh, that's very important because we want z of alpha t to be well-defined for real alpha, otherwise we're not solving the problem. Okay. But other than that, uh, we're free to, to let the domains omega of t vary as we please. Uh, at, time, uh, at time t0, the, the end of our time interval, our domain omega of t is going to pinch off to zero thickness at one point. And so here's a picture of the domains in the complex plane in parameter space. So notice at the, at the, at the top of the slide, we have the beginning of our time interval. We have minus t0. At time minus t0, the, the domain omega looks as shown. It's sort of fat around alpha equals 0 and gets thinner as we get away. But as time moves forward to time 0, we look at the middle picture. And, and uh, around alpha equals 0, the domain is starting to pinch off. And elsewhere, it's starting to grow. And finally, at the end of time, at time uh, plus t0, the domain omega has pinched off to a uh, has pinched off to zero thickness at alpha equals zero, and has gotten quite a bit thicker uh, far away. And well, that's what it looks like. So this is our family of domains. Uh, the domains have to be carefully chosen to reflect the behavior of the unperturbed solution. So we're going to succeed by uh, um, by using the relationship between how the how the domains are changing, and how the unperturbed solution is behaving. And I don't have time to explain that. Speaking of which. OK, uh, just, just a, a quick note. Um, we, we've, we've seen the splash in the first part of the talk. Uh, but notice that, uh, that these omega of t, for God's sake, are not sets of physical points. They are sets of values in complex parameter space, okay? 
So it would be easy to get confused. Okay, now the family of norms. Well, uh, all right, so suppose we have a time t. x of t is the space of all functions that are defined on the closure of the domain omega of t from, from the recent slide, okay? Uh, they take values in C2 because remember Z of alpha t it has two components, Z1 of alpha t and Z2 of alpha t. So we have a mapping from, from omega closure into Z2. They are analytic on the inside. They, they extend to be continuous on the closure. And if we look at them on the boundary, they belong to a Sobolev space. They have four derivatives in L2. Okay? That's the family of norms. We can then look for a perturbed Muscat solution, Z of alpha t, defined for t between negative t0 plus t0 as usual, with, uh, with the features shown on the slide. First of all, uh, the difference between the perturbed and the unperturbed solutions should remain small in the norm x of t as t starts at plus t0 and runs backward to negative t0. So, so we're perturbing the unperturbed solution just a little bit. But the initial conditions, the, the initial z of alpha plus t0, at time plus t0, the, uh, the unperturbed fellow should be prescribed and close to z0 in the relevant norm. But we can start with a z at time t0 and solve backwards in time. All right, we can start with that initial z and it can it has, it has got to be C3 in order to belong to the, to the relevant space, but it needn't be C4. It will have, remember the domain pinches off at one point. There's no real analyticity at that one point. Instead, uh, the only thing you have to work with there is um, four derivatives in L2, and you therefore needn't have four continuous derivatives. Okay? And, uh, and so with that set up, one tries to solve the equation running backwards in time. And it can be done because one can prove an energy estimate, uh, the energy estimate uh, written on the board there, that if you look at the difference between the perturbed and the unperturbed solution at time t, if you evaluate that in the norm uh, xt, uh, the square of that norm satisfies this uh, energy estimate. Uh, and that's valid as long as z is uh, a small perturbation of Z0. And so one has the usual situation in PDE that once you, have, uh, once you have an energy estimate, you win and you can prove that solutions of the equation exist and there is such a solution. Uh, okay, but again, the proof of that energy estimate involves some uh, terms whose sizes you cannot control and which had better be of the correct sign. And they are of the correct sign because of the relationship between the family of domains and the unperturbed Muscat solution. Okay, uh, and, and here on a slide is what I said before. You can, you can prescribe at the initial time t0 anything you like provided it's, uh, it's normous, it, provided it differs only slightly from z0, the unperturbed fellow, in, in the norm for x of t0 and, uh, and, and that uh, that norm has to do with this uh, region that I've drawn, and, uh, and in particular, such functions needn't be uh, C4 at alpha equals zero. Uh, thus, we have found our perturbed Muscat solution that turns over, and then at time plus T0, it no longer belongs to C4. Our Muscat solution begins at time minus T0 as a real analytic graph for, for, uh, for T from minus T0 up until but not including uh, t0, the solution remains real analytic. And at t equals t0, real analyticity fails also at alpha equals zero because our domain has thickness zero only at one point. And so we've done what promised, or at least I promised to do what was promised. Thank you. All right.